What up? I'm Dr. CBS here with Doc Jab, and you're tuned in to episode 13 of The Last Dope Intellectual. All right, y'all. So today I want to shoot the shit with Jab about this idea of perfect victimhood, because yet another killing has taken place in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Um, Andrew Brown Jr. was gunned down, shot in the back, ostensibly while police were trying to serve a search and drug warrant. We have Makia Bryant, who was shot in the chest four times by the police because she was going after some other women with a knife. And even amongst our own people, amongst Black folks, people are rationalizing this use of violence against these people because of the acts in which they were engaged at the time that they were shot, as if the, the violence used against them was warranted because they weren't the perfect victims. And I just think that is so crazy, okay? And as many, many folks have pointed out by now, these white folks that are shooting up multiple people with assault rifles, with arsenals and duffel bags, somehow they always live, right? But even when the police roll up on them, as they are in the middle of a shootout, they always live. And, and yet and still for our folks, it's as if they have to comply, they have to listen to all commands, they have to be wholly, quote unquote, innocent of whatever it is. Uh, you know, they have to be doing something uh, benign. And that is the only way that we can have compassion or, you know, that that we can really have a authentic critique of the police. Because if our people were doing anything wrong, then somehow they deserved being murdered by the police. And that shit is so crazy to me. No, absolutely. And it, it's clear that a lot of folks in our community and elsewhere are drinking too much of their petty. <laughs> Kathleen would be like, uh, nah, <laughs> I know. OTP. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, so, I mean, it, 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 again, it's, 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 it's clear. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, it's a clear sign of the ongoing class struggles within our communities that I think this is part of the problem because we we want that uh, to your point the perfect victim that, that they have to be perhaps you know enrolled in college and have no no record and not have any warrants or or to be you know uh, uh, behaving or performing a a, 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 a sense of um, or performing uh, activities that that we would be comfortable having performed or that we would maybe do ourselves before we can ever engage appropriately uh, uh, in, in, in the right critique about what is going on. Now, obviously there are plenty, of, not plenty, but there are a lot of people out there uh, uh, right, righteously protesting, clear on the issue, not letting any of this get, but there are, there, there, there does seem to be this uh, loud pocket uh, or at least a well-promoted pocket uh, in our community or in our in, among our so-called spokespeople that want to point to, well, maybe if they weren't holding a knife or selling loose cigarettes, or maybe if they had paid all their uh, motor vehicle fines or whatever. Uh, um, but the reality is, uh, none of these, to your point, should result in the kinds of, or certainly the levels of, of violence and death that continue to 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 be suffered. Uh, and, uh, y you know, all, none of these conditions would exist if we weren't already in some sort of wildly ignoble relationship. So it, the perfect victim, I mean, any victim is a perfect victim. I mean, and, and I think should be seen that way. Yeah. It's like, these are, um, these are supposed, they're supposed to be peace officers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like called law enforcement, but they're also called like officers of the peace. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be trained in de-escalation mm -hmm. tactics, I thought. But this just goes to, so th this is why we say, you know, we say abolish the police because there's always going to be some sort of excuse to legitimate whatever it is that they did. And because we have it so ingrained in our minds that we need police officers, that they actually do more good than harm, that they actually are there to protect us when we know they're here to protect property, 
and to protect the interests of the ruling class, period, and to protect the capitalist system. The other interesting thing is that all of these crimes that are that victims are committing or all of these violations are so class rooted, right? As you were saying, selling loose cigarettes, getting into an altercation. Mind you, I used to fight all the time, mm. sometimes with weapons, right? I've had a warrant. If I Listen, I am a college professor. I have a PhD. I have had a warrant, right? For some goofy shit, whatever. But, you know, but so none of us, you know, so these are these are kind of class rooted crimes. Um, you know, Trayvon Martin just walking through a neighborhood. These are things that these are forms of the criminalization of behavior that accrue around not only black people, but poor and working class black people. And so constantly we need to bring up um, the class reality into the equation because it's easy for some bourgeois Negro to be like, well, you shouldn't have been doing this or shouldn't, shouldn't have been doing that. But if you're never in these situations that require um, being part of the alternative economy, that require you to brawl from time to time, you know, that re that might require you to miss a court date, you know, because you have some stupid misdemeanor or whatever, you miss a court date, therefore you have a warrant. Those are not situations that are necessarily readily familiar, so it's easy to judge. But it's even some of our working class comrades, our black working class comrades who have this same idea that if we just comport ourselves or behave in a particular way, then these things wouldn't happen. But that's just simply not the case. It's gonna happen. It's so ar the violence is so arbitrary. It's consistent, but arbitrary that it doesn't really matter what black poor folks are doing. We are potentially um, going to be used for target practice by these cops, period. Look, sometimes women uphold patriarchy. Sometimes black people uphold white supremacy. And there are occasions where even poor people uphold some class bias against their own position. So, I mean, if we we unfortunately have to deal with these these contradictions. Uh, but like my godfather said, don't don't ask me what I was doing when the cops pulled me over and locked me up. Come get me out like that. That, you know, and, and, and that yeah. anyway, that's where I that's my baseline as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I, you know, we have to just get to a point where it does not matter what the fuck somebody's doing. The cops should not be shooting them up. Even if uh Makia Bryant did have a knife and was wielding a knife, there are supposed to be a whole host of other things before you shoot a, a child in the chest. Can you imagine? Like regular people in the neighborhood, when you break up a fight, do you automatically go and get a gun and shoot the people who are fighting? No, mm. you do all sorts of other shit. And the thing, and those cops are more well protected mm. than a, a, if a regular person just came to break up a fight. They have all sorts of all sorts of gadgets and doodads or whatever that are supposed to help them de-escalate or manage situations. And, and so supposedly just, been trained for those situations. We keep giving more money for this training, for this diversity training, for this sensitivity training, for this professionalization of the police. And yet these fucking troglodytes, the first thing they do is reach for a gun. And if you don't obey their initial command, like you're some sort of dog, then that legitimates them shooting you down in the street. But Dr. CBS, I have to correct you. Sometimes they're not reaching for a gun. They're reaching for a taser that they mistakenly, but they, you know, they're reaching for a taser and only mistakenly pull out the gun and use the gun. So I just wanted yeah. to offer that correction. That's so true. And it's crazy because I guess many of, of us have been in the experience where we confuse a fucking Nerf gun, a big, brightly colored plastic thing for, you know, for a real gun. So Look, again, I keep saying you know, nobody who's ever held a weapon can confuse, I think, a taser with a real gun. And nobody would confuse even an unloaded weapon for a loaded weapon. So so I, I, I never I, I just never I'm never interested in that line whatsoever. And why the fuck are these bitch ass cops always so confused? They confuse Tamir <laughs> Rice's play gun, yeah. right? For a real gun. It's like you're always confused. You're always scared. You're always making these dumbass mistakes. Like you don't have the luxury to make those mistakes because clearly you're you are you're death dealing out here, mm. right? You you are y'all are y'all are body collectors, so you don't get the luxury of making no dumbass mistakes like that. And so mm. I'm tired of these confused, scared um disoriented cops like your job that like you don't you don't you're not afforded that luxury period and we all know it's bullshit work.
Yeah, exactly. Go you go be scared working at fucking 7 Eleven. How about that? How about that? Filling up Slurpee cups. So <laughs> um, I just want to implore our people. Stop being pig apologists. I don't give a fuck what our people were doing. Okay. They do not, we do not deserve to be shot down. And the police have the responsibility to use all the tools in their toolkit before reaching for their guns to quote unquote uphold the law, right? Period. And so this is why we need to understand ourselves as, you know, as colonized and occupied people, because shooting, shooting first and asking questions later is how you treat occupied people. That's how you treat people in a wartime situation. Even theoretically, even then you're supposed to, <laughs> there's supposed to be other tactics. Rules of right? engagement. And, yeah. So stop, stop demanding perfect victims. First of all, we don't exist because there people will always find an excuse. And because we deserve to live. We deserve to make mistakes. We deserve to fuck up and do whatever it is that we do and still not be shot down. All right, y'all. So we have another dope interview today with one of my uh, great friends and teachers, Professor Hakeem Adi. Uh, so he is a professor of the history of Africa and the African diaspora at the University of uh, Chichester. I should have asked him how to pronounce that. He'll correct me, I'm sure. Um, Hakeem was the first historian of African heritage to become a professor of history in Britain. In January 2018, he launched the world's first online master's by research program on the history of Africa and the African diaspora. Uh, he's also the founder. Uh, he's also the founder and consultant historian of the Young Historians Project, which can be found at younghistoriansproject.org. Hakeem is the author of West Africans in Britain, 1900 to 1960, Nationalism, Pan-Africanism and Communism. Boop, right here. Um, let me make sure. Oh, whoop. okay. There you go. Um, he is also the author with Marika Sherwood of the 1945 Manchester Pan-African Congress Revisited and Pan-African History, Political Figures from Africa and the Diaspora since 1787. His most recent books are Pan-Africanism and Communism. That is this one here, one of my favorites. Um, and uh, Pan-Africanism, A History this guy right here. Um, and um, he's the editor of Black British History, New Perspectives. He is currently writing a book on the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain to be published by Penguin. Hakeem has appeared in many documentary films, including one of one that I showed to all my students, which is called 500 Years Later. He's also been on TV and on radio and has written widely on the history of Africa and the African diaspora, including three history books for children. Visit his website at www.hakeemadi.org. So welcome, Hakeem. Great to be here. How are you doing? Great to be I'm here. I'm great. Okay, yeah. so did I pronounce, how do you pronounce the name of your university? Okay, I'm going to do it in three syllables to make it easier because it's difficult for you to get your tongue around those very English sounds. Che, uh -huh. che, uh -huh. stir. Chichester. Thank you. Okay. That's so brilliant. You've got a great teacher. That's all I can say. Yes, yes, you, you've done amazingly. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to speak to you today. I'm so um, happy to be here and spoken to. <laughs> so I want to start uh, with Pan-Africanism. So you've written quite a bit on this subject. Can you tell me what interests you about Pan-Africanism? I suppose uh, <clears throat> it's just something that was there in front of me. I, I guess if you're interested in the history of Africa and the African diaspora, it's something that kind of leaps out at you, that's something that's always present. Because historically, Africans, by, by which I include all people of African heritage, have, especially in the modern period, have looked for ways to to, to liberate themselves, to emancipate themselves, to, to deal with various problems that 
present themselves that they're confronted with. So whether that is enslavement, human trafficking, uh, colonialism, uh, imperialism, racism, and various other problems which the, the capital-centered system ha has presented. Um, Africans have found it necessary to get together, to work together. Um, and that is really the kind of essence of Pan-Africanism, that need for unity, that concept that the struggle of any one section is uh, part of the struggle of all, that an advance for any one section of African people is an advance for all, the idea that Africans need to be united to advance their interest and to to liberate themselves and the necessity of the liberation of the African continent as um, significant and important for those in the diaspora. All these elements of, of Pan-Africanism are, you know, an integral part of the history of Africa and its diaspora. So it's impossible to study that history in any meaningful way without coming across some elements or aspects of Pan-Africanism. And so um, I, you know, kind of been forced, not forced, but compelled to study it, to um, examine it. And as I say, particularly because I'm interested in those means, mechanisms, ideas connected with liberation, because um, we're, we're still in that capital-centered world. People are still looking for the means to we're still looking for the means to liberate ourselves, emancipate ourselves, become the decision makers. So it's it's important to look at, to understand, to sum up all that experience. And Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. kind of you know includes all that experience with many different streams and currents, some more significant or more important than others. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do how does one be or you know, an actually existing Pan-Africanist. So for example, there's so much going on in the African continent right now, whether in Mali or in Chad, in Ethiopia, uh, in Mozambique, all of these places, and we can't be on the ground everywhere. So as a Pan-Africanist, how is it that we stay abreast of and engage uh, issues that are happening in the continent and indeed throughout the diaspora when they're, they're very complicated and we don't, and there's no clear so-called good, there's no clear imperialist, for example, or, or um, you know, there's no good guys and bad guys. So anyway, I guess the question is like, what does it mean to be an actually existing Pan-Africanist in these times? There's no good guys and bad guys. There's no imperialists. When, when did, yeah, when did I mean, this happen? This news hasn't reached me yet in So South when it's Kingdom. not, when it's not just, you know, of course, America, there is imperialism. I'm not saying that there's not. But when there's a situation, a given conflict in a country, I mean, I guess we can see, like, who are the U.S. imperialists or the British imperialists, the French imperialists backing. But sometimes it's not that simple. So if we look at the situation in Ethiopia, for example, it's not reducible to imperialist machinations. And so, again, as, as Pan-Africanists, like, what is our responsibility to engaging what's happening and doing that in a sort of informed and ethical way? Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh... You know, there's a lot of issues there. I mean, I think one aspect of it is that these struggles are interconnected and that they're kind of more interconnected now because the diaspora is so um, so global. You know, mm -hmm. there are, you know, for example, there are Ethiopians and Eritreans here in Britain, just as there are in the US, just as there are in Australia and so on. So they're part of you know, the population of this country or any other country. So what what is going on, um, you know, in, in Ethiopia, you could say, is of significance and importance um, to us here, just like any struggle. There, there are, you could say there's one humanity, so there's one struggle. That we're, we, we're, we are concerned or we should be concerned about all those struggles that are for the rights of people, for their liberation, for their advancement and so on. Um, but I think, think historically, people have recognized that, um, you know, the, the, the struggles that have gone on in Africa are of particular importance to those in the diaspora um, for, for a whole variety of other reasons, which to have to do with the way that kind of racism operates and is constructed. Um, 
the fact that yes that there are common enemies whether that's u.s imperialism or british imperialism and so on so i think these these historically are the things that have been taken into account as well as the fact that you know we're living in a kind of capital-centered world with an imperialist system of states and so on so a victory against any part of that system is a kind of victory for everybody or a victory for all africans so those are some of the the, the issues. I mean, today it is more complicated because the world is quite a, a complex place. And I mean, the other aspect of Pan-Africanism is that you could say people also struggle where they are. And that struggle inspires and informs the struggles of others. And I guess in that context, you know, something like Black Lives Matter is a, you could say, is a sort of modern manifestation of Pan-Africanism. Sim simply because people of African heritage in different parts of the world face similar problems. What happens on the streets of Minnesota or in the US affects what's going on in Britain or in other parts of the world. So people see their, their struggles, their situation as being interconnected. And I guess the most important part of all of that is that first of all, we are, we are trying to resolve the problems, the contradictions, the struggles where we are, whether it's in Minnesota mm. or it's in London or it's in Chicago and so on. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we do whatever we can to support those struggles that are going on in, in Ethiopia or Mali or whatever. And if, if we look at Mali, for example, um, you know, you, you quite clearly see who the imperialists are because the US are there, the British are there, the French are there, right. the, the EU is there, they're all there. So the problems, the, the issues become very clear. If we go to Libya, <clears throat> again, who is there? Well, NATO is there, the US mm -hmm. is there, Britain's there, France is there. So these questions are very important for not just those in Africa, for whom they're very important, but for those of us who are kind of in the belly of the beast. That is, it is governments who act in our name, mm -hmm. who say we're going here to because we have the right to protect, or we're going here because of for humanitarian intervention, or we're going here to uh, bring democracy and so on. So we have a then a responsibility to to um, anyway to, to to expose that, to expose these lies, to you know educate. Where it's people, a cabral. <laughs> to you know to talk, to try and prevent these crimes taking mm -hmm. place. You know, very 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 difficult, but. And of course, the crimes that they're carrying out in Mali or Libya, they're also carrying out in Afghanistan or yes. Iraq or Iran or all over the place. So all of these things are interconnected, and it, it's difficult. And it's always been, uh, even you know, for the Pan-Africanists. Yes, you may be particularly interested in Africa, you may be particularly interested in the diaspora, but of course, you're also concerned about what's happening elsewhere, and if you you know, you look at the, the Manchester Pan-African Congress, for example, one of the most famous Pan-African gatherings in 1945, they're also raising the issue of what's going on in Palestine. They're mm -hmm. talking about the struggles of oppressed people in all countries. They're saying, you know, labor in the white skin cannot be emancipated whilst labor in the black skin is enslaved. They're, Where it's a they, were, they were internationalists, to use a phrase which is bandied about in a vague way these days <laughs> they were concerned we'll about that we will get to that in a second yeah. but yes <laughs> but but you can't be concerned about what's going on in africa or what concerns africans or what concerns african americans without being concerned with what affects everybody else because we live in uh, the same world the same country the same imperialist system of state so yes we might have a particular focus yes we might be particularly concerned about black lives or we might be particularly particularly concerned about ethiopia or africa or but we do all of that in the context of this concept of you know one humanity one struggle i would say okay okay thank you for that i know i just threw that at you but uh that was really helpful um okay so one of your favorite book or one of my favorite books that you've written is Pan-Africanism and Communism, which is, and the title is a riff off of George Padmore's Pan-Africanism or Communism. 
So I just wanted wondered if you could speak about that and right as opposed to the or and what are you trying to convey in in that book? Um, yeah, I mean the you know Padmore's book was written at a certain moment in history um, where he kind of counterposes, as it were, these two orientations, these two paths, and on the one hand there's communism and on the other hand pan-Africanism, as if there has to be a choice between them. Um, but for, for much of his life, or certainly for the early part of his life, he combined these two perspectives, these two orientations, um, these two ideologies, if you like, in his activism, because he was a, a communist who was particularly concerned with the liberation of Africa and the African diaspora. That was his focus. So my book, Pan-Africanism Pan and Communism, is about that uh, unity, if you like, between Pan-Africanism and Communism, which was particularly evident in the activities of those associated with the, the Communist International in the interwar period between 1919 and 1939, where various organizations were established by communists or by principally or, or led by black communists very often, which had the Revolu revolutionary orientation of the Communist International, or revolutionary approach to colonialism, to racism, to imperialism, and so on, but recognize that there was some um, uh, significant connection between Africa and its diaspora, that all those of African heritage faced similar kinds of problems were sympathetic to each other in various ways and so on and so organizations were established in the us in britain in france in other countries and internationally which which reflected that um connection between pan-africanism and communism and essentially what i say in the book is that the the communist international had a pan-africanist perspective it, it recognized that um those in Africa and the diaspora were an important, um, you could say, political force, which was being or had been neglected in various ways. You know, people saying, well, you know, the main struggle is in Europe or the main struggle is amongst white workers or whatever it was said. And Lenin and the Communist International said, no, that's not correct. That um, you could say this one one humanity, one struggle. And as Lenin pointed out in his famous work, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, that, that the imperialist system of states could well be broken at its weakest link. So that could have been in Africa, it could have been in the Caribbean, it could have been anyway, anywhere. So for the revolutionaries, for the communists, it was vital to organize amongst Africans, Africa and the diaspora. They were also concerned that uh, African troops might be used as kind of ca cannon fodder in the same way that African troops and others had been used during the First World War. So there were other um, things that they were concerned about. And they were also concerned about the divisions that racism was used to divide the workers in places like Britain, in France, the US, and elsewhere. So this unity of workers, this unity of the international communist movement, this, inter this unity of the workers and oppressed people of all countries was extremely important. So the mm -hmm. book details those discussions, those deliberations, those activists during that period. And then you could go on and look at um, even the period after that, where you see that many of the main activists in Africa and the diaspora have had or have connections with the communist movement or with, with Marxism more generally. And you can reel off a whole list of names from the Panthers to Wait a minute. and on to this, to the, 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 sorry. So you're telling me that Marxism, Leninism is not simply Eurocentric, 
that we can't just discount Marxism because Marx was German and his locus of enunciation was Europe. You mean to tell me that Marxism Leninism can does, should not all just objectively be discarded because it's Eurocentric? Well, who who said it should be? <laughs> you, see, you see, when we, I mean, without going into, you know, do we discard, you know, Newtonian science or do we discard, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, laws of relativity because, you know, Einstein wasn't African or I don't know. You know, if we go, if we go far, far back into the history of Africa, we find that the conception of what Marx called materialism, um, we find that in you know ancient Egyptian philosophy. In fact, I think the ancient Egyptian understanding of the creation of the world was that it emerged out of out of water, out of matter. Therefore, matter was primary. It wasn't, which is the anyway the principal basis of materialism. You know, dialectics, which some people erroneously like to trace back to the, the ancient Greeks was also a concept which existed in ancient Egypt and now in other parts of Africa, of course, because you know the the world moves in that way. So the principles, the underlying sort of principles of Marxism, I'm putting this kind of simply and quickly. <laughs> uh, di dialectics and materialism are one could argue these are kind of African concepts as much as that they're universal concepts. But the, the, the other point is that we live in, the key thing about sort of Marxist approaches are that they're concerned with the way that the capital-centered system works or doesn't work. Um, and Marxism, Leninism, as you call it, is, is concerned with understanding how this system works or doesn't work and how it will be brought to to an end, and you know what is the force that's going to bring it to an end. So, so all of us who live in the capital center system should, should be very interested in that, because the vast majority of us want to uh, want an alternative to what currently exists. And Marxism and Leninism is about that alternative and about how to, to bring it about. So, if you if you want to reject it, then, I mean, I guess that's fine, but then you have to have something else, which is even better, um, which is which which analyzes the way that capitalism operates or doesn't operate in a more scientific way and provides that compass, that orientation, which um, Marxism essentially does. So I'd, I'm not uh, aware that anybody has developed that, those principles, of course, the Marxism of Marx, you know, Marx lived in the 19th century in, in, mm -hmm. in, Ger in Germany and in Britain. The world is different. Right. And so, you know, Marxism, as Engels famously said, you know, our theory is not a dogma, it's a guide to action. So it's not mm. a dogma, it's not, this is what it was in, in 1848, therefore everybody has to, no, you ha it's, it's a way of analyzing the world it gives you a, a kind of vantage point so that you can work out what needs to be done to essentially to bring this current, uh, you know, terrible, <laughs> terrible system to an end and usher in something where, you know, majority of us are the decision makers where the great wealth which is produced collectively by everybody is used for the benefit of everybody and so on. That's the, the, the kind of essence of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's using that creatively and developing it for the 21st century. You, ha you can't just say this was what somebody said in 1848. You, you have to apply it and use it to, to guide um, and give the perspective that's required in the, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so shifting back to your internationalism shade, in your book, uh, Pan-Africanism, A History, you really open with a case against the use of Black internationalism in particular. I believe you call it, to paraphrase, like a figment 
of the black American scholarly imagination. Now, this is something we came up with because nobody historically describes themselves as black internationalists. I think you mentioned Jane Ardall and her use of, I, I can't speak French, but internationalism noir. noir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you say other than that, it's not a real, it's not something rooted in like historical or, ar or archival fact. And so can you explain your issue with the concept of, um, of black internationalism? I, I mean, I don't really have an issue with it. I mean, I just wrote that really to kind of tease you in particular. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, the, the, the thing is that, <clears throat> um, you know, for many years, people have talked about Pan-Africanism or th throughout the 20th century, people have talked about Pan-Africanism and we, we kind of understand what is meant by that, you know, very broad church that pan-africanism is um you know since 1900 there have been uh, pan-african conferences there are still pan-african conferences you know over a century later people have referred to themselves as pan-africanists people have written books uh using the term pan-africanism so it's in a way it's a bit like you know having the wheel and then somebody comes along and says well yeah, you, we had all this, but let me reinvent the wheel and let me call it something else. Well, um, you can call it something else, but it's still going to be a wheel. So then the question, the question has to be posed that those who want to use the term black internationalism, well, what, what's the significance of this term? If, if you look at uh, the way that Jeanne Nadal used it in the 1920s, she, she used it, uses it to describe Pan-Africanism. <laughs> The Pan Africanism of the day, um, you know, the Du Boisian conferences, congresses, uh, Garveyism, the fact that people in France and elsewhere were, were showing a greater, people in the diaspora were showing a greater concern with Africa. This is what she's describing. And I don't think anybody in France or anybody anywhere else took up that phrase, that term, and, and ran with it and used it. So, you know, it may be that. You know, somebody in the U.S. decided that it was a good thing to to use to for, for some purpose, but I, I don't really know what that purpose is. The, the The other question, the other issue is, you could say, what is internationalism? So, so internationalism, we we kind of have an understanding of what internationalism is related to the kind of political struggles that have been waged in the world. Um, the struggles of, you know, working people of all countries and some, you could say that um, internationalism is kind of summed up in the famous words of Marx and Engels, um, you know, workers of the world unite or workers of all lands unite. So internationalism is the expression of, of the idea that there's one humanity, there's one struggle, and as uh, like I've mentioned before, and of course, they're international, they're organizations which call themselves international the first international, the second international, the third international. So these are um, elements of internationalism. Um, so then to say that there's a kind of black internationalism, it's not, what does that mean? It's a bit like saying there's a, there's a black Marxism. I mean, what does it? really mean surely well, we do say that so well, well, you, I, well, I well call you, it you, well, you, you say <laughs> we i mean there's some people in the us who use these funny phrases like, of course but um we don't say you know anyway i mean that that's so that's the issue i mean if if people want to say it you know fine but it to me it's 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 just unnecessary and it's just creates confusion about First of all, it creates confusion about Pan-Africanism, and secondly, it creates confusion about internationalism. So I don't mm. see the, the use of it, the need for it all mm. the attention. So there's this other conceptual framework of African internationalism that's used by um, some, some groups to distinguish, so which seems to be equivalent to revolutionary pan-Africanism. Because as in my perspective, pan-Africanism is sort of ecumenical in terms of ideology. It's not just radical. It's not reducible to mm -hmm. its radical wing. And so we, when we say radical or revolutionary pan-Africanism, it's precisely that history that you've narrated emanating from folks like Padmore, et cetera, right? 
Right. Uh, and so the term African internationalism is used to distinguish between the, the more, the ideologically diverse Pan-Africanism to specifically specify bringing together Pan-Africanism, right? But also the, the revolutionary um, potential or the revolutionary specification of the international that you've just described. And so what do you think about that African, African internationalism? Um, well, yeah, it's it's not it's not a a term I'm particularly familiar with. So you know, with, although your you know presentation of it makes you know a certain amount of sense, it's not a um, it's not a term that I would necessarily use. I mean, I think if you say revolutionary Pan Africanism, you know, you kind of got an idea what that means. Um, um, you know that there are these revolutionary currents within Pan-Africanism and there are reformist currents within it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about African internationalism to me. I'm not, I'm not really sure what that, what that would mean. Hmm. All right. Ongoing, ongoing debate. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit, what is it like working in Great Britain or just okay Britain, depending on who you ask, um, on the history of African people? And have your colleagues in the institutions at which you've worked been supportive or hostile or a combination of both? Uh, that's a difficult one. It's, um, <clears throat> I would say up until, you know, probably about, maybe four or five years ago, it was probably very difficult. Um, we didn't have, although we had some, um, some kind of centers which focus on the history of Africa in particular, um, we, we don't, didn't really have a conception of, or a center of Africa and the diaspora. In fact, I think I'm still the only person who um, really focuses on Africa and the diaspora. I mean, in the U.S., it's it's much more common, but in Britain, it's not very common. Um, so that's a bit of a bit of a problem. And I think, in general, um, there's been a, a disconnect between what we could call sort of community concerns, where there's a lot of interest, and always has been a lot of interest in history, history of Africa, history of the Caribbean, the history of um the diaspora in britain and so on you know there are a lot of meetings and things going on but there's been a disconnect between that and what happens in what people call the academy or the university so i think that's that's difficult um and you know we so we find not that many students studying um history and certainly not many black students studying history. Um, that's changed a little bit, I would say, over the, the last few years, um, partly as, as a result of some of the work we've done, partly as a result of just the kind of circumstances um, that people have, have, have sought to want to know why isn't, you know, my history being presented or taught in schools or at universities and so on. And that sort of, culminated with the Black Lives Matter movement of, la of last year, where a lot of this kind of came out, um, particularly from young people. And so we've seen in the, literally in the last year, about half a dozen posts in universities for, you know, people to teach what, what people call Black British history, whether that's a good or a bad term. So before that, there were no post. I think I was actually the first person to have a post in Black British history 25 years ago. Um, but since then, there haven't been, there haven't been any. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of difficult. Um, we've just kind of started a, a journal, an online journal, which, which focuses on this history in Britain. Um, but we're still in the kind of early stages. Uh, I mean, there have been one or two people that have worked in this area, you know, for years. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult. We even now have some people from the U.S. U.S. coming over here, 
and uh, much to your chagrin, I'm sure. And you assisting don't, you don't like us, us that much. Assisting <laughs> us, assisting us in our endeavors, giving us the benefit of their expertise and knowledge, helping us to understand the history of this country, and we're very indebted to them for their their contribution. So no. Every, you know, it's good for everyone to contribute. But yeah, it's it's kind of early stages, I think. So um, this is another random question that I didn't submit to you, but what is there a connection between, why do you think that the British, Black British cultural studies kind of took off? Because that seems to have a, more, and I don't know if, you know, that seems to have to be a thing, but then this, the type of African or Black British history that you work on is still more nascent. Is there a relationship between these or what do you think? I would say that I mean, I'm not that familiar with what you refer to as uh, cultural studies, but I'm not sure what kind of impact that has on sort of the, the population at large. By that, I mean mm. the, the African and Caribbean population. Um, it might be something which, you know, academics like to discuss, but, you know, all these kind of theories and I'm not sure that that has much uh, carries much weight amongst. So that that may be that's, you know, it's something without mentioning names. It's something which um, has taken off in academia or di or did in the past certainly. Um, but then you might argue that if that was so important to to those in academia, why weren't these other aspects of this experience developed alongside it and and then and they weren't um yeah you, you know if you to, to be a historian in this area you you kind of really need to be a, a sort of activist as well because you know what's taught in schools the way that archives operate the way that museums operate the, the kind of general absence of our history everywhere um all that is only changing very very slowly and very recently i saw on the tv today there's a you know big thing that uh the film director steve mcqueen made a mini series mini tv series here focusing on kind of aspects of our history and it's it's up for an award you know because it's uh, it's it's almost a novelty and in the british film and television awards i think it's been nominated for 15 prizes or whatever but th th these things are you know that it's taken time to get to but yeah there, there is there's movement now and i think it's more closely connected with you know what people at sort of grassroots level want and require and so on and we we've, we've set up various um means to try and develop it like the young historians project is is a project which works amongst young people of african and caribbean heritage to encourage them to engage with history to undertake their own research to develop um, the presentation of history for their peers and so on so that's taken off over the last five years and been quite successful and then We've set up a master's program to encourage people to come and research and to get engaged in history and so on. And there are other, other things going on. But yeah, it's, um, it's a struggle. Like life is generally a struggle. It's a struggle and uh, we have to keep going with it because it's, you know, it's important. It's, um, you know, part of, part of being that if your history is ignored is like you don't exist that you're unimportant that um and you know it's important to fight that's one of the manifestations of racism and eurocentrism in this country that for so long that's been the case and it's it's hopefully beginning to to change now beginning to change great okay finally what are you working on now? What can we expect next from Dr. Hakim Adi? Well, as you pointed out in your introduction, I'm working on a history of African and Caribbean people in Britain, um, which will be yeah, you know, kind of complete history from, I guess, like 10,000 years ago or something up until last year. Um, I'm not covering all of that 
I mean, 10,000 years, we have the first black Britain, although that black Britain didn't come directly from Africa or the Caribbean for that matter, but the latest archeological research shows that the, the most ancient Britons that we kind of know about um, were or have been dubbed black. They had, you know, dark skin and dark hair, but with blue eyes. Um, so anyway, it, it goes from that uh, gentleman right up until mm. Black Lives Matter. So it tries to cover the entire history, essentially of about 2,000 years of history. So that's what I'm working on, or that's what's working on me. Um, <laughs> and hopefully that will be finished in the next couple of months. And I don't know how long, when it will be published, probably next year sometime. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. And I also include, of course, African-Americans uh, where necessary in that. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all always be having smoke with African-Americans. Listen, we out here. We matter. Yeah, but well, as long as you're out there, that's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. No, uh, it, it includes, you know, it, it's in, in this kind of history, you just cannot include everything but sort of but right. it tries to give a, a a summary of the key issues and some of the key personalities over that period and also to kind of summarize what's been written over the last 30 years because over the last 30 years there has been quite a lot of work um, by mm -hmm. individuals and so on so it's my, the aim was to kind of summarize all this and present it in a way that will be useful for you know for people who are you know, come to the history or want to look for more information where they can look and what exists and so on. So it's, you know, hopefully it will be useful for that, for that purpose. Wonderful. Dr. Hakeem Adi, thank you so much for being here and being in conversation with me. I'm sure uh, the audience viewers learned a great deal and I hope to have you back when your book drops. Um, when I get a chance to read it, I hope it's not too long, but it sounds like it's going to be like 2,000 pages, and then we can discuss no, it. No, it won't be 2,000 pages. I, I'll shorten it a little bit just for people like you who find reading long books a little bit challenging. I'll keep it. Laborious. A laborious lark. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but it's a kind of book I'm not expecting you or anyone to kind of take it to bed and read it. You know, you, you dip into it, the things that you'll be interested in, you'll want to read. Some of you will put it away for a few months and you might look at it again and look at a different section. It's, you know, that's the way big books are, isn't it? You don't necessarily read them immediately cover to cover. You use them as, use them as, as tools to help understanding and, you know, as, as is required. So that's the, that's the intention and hope and aim. Okay, friends. So for this segment of Top 5 Dead or Alive, which again is the segment where I and or Jared will list our top five or at least the top five that come to mind of a given subject, topic, issue, theme, or happening. And this week we are dropping our favorite Huber Harrison facts, writings, ruminations, etc. in honor of the, you know, the Dean of Harlem Radicalism's birthday, which was just dropped on uh, April 27th. So we are going to run our top five, or at least the top five that come to mind of things we love about Hubert Harrison. And so I will start. First, I want to mention this little tiny pamphlet, Hubert Harrison, The Black Socrates, which talks about Hubert Harrison in the context of his atheism and how he has historically been left out of scholarship on atheism for a number of reasons, because he's black, because he uh, for a long time was relatively unknown. But I highly recommend, this was, I think, one of the first things I ever read about Hubert Harrison. And so it's just a little, it's the pamphlet's about 10, 12 pages, but, um, but I just wanted to bring this into people's consciousness. Hubert Henry, Hubert Henry Harrison, The Black Socrates by John G. Jackson. So what's your five? Right on. It's funny that you you started with that because mine, well, mine starts with the fact that we named the 2020 Hate Awards after Hubert Henry Harrison, the Hubert Henry Harrison Hate Awards. But mine also started, but which was connected to to my my understanding of of uh, or my introduction to him as the Black Socrates, which came oddly from not John Jackson, uh, the late great atheist African historian, 
genius, but uh, J.A. Rogers, who yeah. called him that in in his uh, at the time the what the great black. I think just men was in the title of history. Mm -hmm. You got it in front of you? I don't know. I thought you were about to grab it. But. Yeah, well, because John G. Jackson talks about it in this book. Um, that's it, where he first learned about uh, okay. Hubert Harrison. Um, it's the it's the the world's great men of color. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And there were multiple volumes, which I have downstairs somewhere around, somewhere. Which, I was looking I for mine, too. Yeah. And and uh, so, yeah, anyway, so so that, that was my... And, and, and I if, and I can't remember who this. I'm just going to say it was James Turner, but somebody in Africana had had sort of joked that that it was it was uh, demeaning to call Harrison uh, the Black Socrates, uh, where it should have been something more along the lines as 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 the, like the modern day Imhotep or something like that. The 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 latest in the the legacy of African geniuses, not needing to to throw in a reference to a Greek, but. Anyway, I just anyway, but still, it was it was uh, that's that's funny that we both started there. We're in mm -hmm. similar places, yeah. So then, in keeping with text, y'all know y'all know me. I'm a I'm a have some text. I'm gonna have some books. I want to hold up um, holding aloft the banner of Ethiopia by Winston James. It's holding aloft the banner of Ethiopia, Caribbean radicalism in early 20th century America. Because this is actually where I first stumbled across Hubert Harrison, um, and in fact. What I love about Hubert Harrison is he trained up so many of the black radicals that I love, like Grace Campbell, like Cyril Briggs, like Richard B. Moore. So all the founders of the African Blood Brotherhood, who many of whom went on to join the Communist Party, um, who wrote for the, the various radical publications alongside writing for the Negro world. And so they were very much influenced by him. And so this book was where I first encountered Hubert Harrison. I was like, who that? Um and so I highly recommend the book. And then I highly recommend reading up on the, the, the sort of cadre, the radical cadre of, of students that he trained uh, as well. Right on. Uh, I'm glad I, did, I didn't know. I'm not familiar with that book. So I'm, I appreciate learning about that. Uh, um, I have to catch up to that as well. Um, mine is more vague. My number four is more vague, and it's something that you made a, 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 a sort of a joke about me a, a couple of episodes ago, but but is certainly more applicable to Harrison. That that I always just appreciated that he was often too red for black folks and too mm -hmm. black for white folks. Uh, and, but that similarly that that put him in connection with all the people that you just mentioned there, but also people like Garvey, of course. Uh, and then also at the, the forefront of not only both incorporating a, a socialist or, a, a, you know, a communist analysis, but also uh, properly racializing it and saying that that uh, there needs to be some some black led formations uh, who engage that sort of politics. So uh, I that's just sort of my broad number four that I, that I uh, continue to always you know and appreciate about Harrison. So connected to that, I want to lift up um, thinking about, so Hubert Harrison was an editor of the Negro World for a long time. Eventually he fell out with Garvey, but I want to lift up an article by one of my comrades and a, an amazing Hubert Harrison scholar named Brian Quoba um, that just dropped recently. It's called Pebbles and Ripples, Hubert Harrison and the Rise of the Garvey Movement. And just to read the abstract, it says, Hubert Harrison represents a pioneer of the black radical tradition whose historical restoration requires us to rethink the origins of the Garvey movement. Harrison and his Liber Liberty League of Negro Americans modeled many of the key strategic, ideological, and cultural components that Garvey would adopt for his Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, including the United States and Harlem in, in particular as a headquarters, the focus on mass social movement building, the ideology of race first, support for the nationalist struggles like the Irish and a tricolor flag to symbolize black liberation. At a time when Marcus Garvey was on the verge of returning to Jamaica, he caught a break by joining forces with, Har uh, with Harrison in Harlem. As a result, Harrison's organization exerted a decisive influence on Garvey, prompting him to shift his vision of the UNIA from a Tuskegee Institute emulator to a vehicle for building a global pan-African and black nationalist social movement. And so here we see like, again, so Hubert Harrison has just been so erased from history that we don't even see the ways in which Hubert Harrison is actually a progenitor or a, 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 a shaper of Garveyism and of uh, the way that Marcus Garvey was thinking about not only his organization, but his ideology. And so Hubert Harrison is very, 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 very important. And this is why he's considered to be the father 
um, the father of, of Harlem black radicalism. So. Absolutely. And uh, um, the, I think it's the only book of his that I read years ago uh, when Africa awakes I think I have that right, but I think that mm -hmm. that that was that was um, uh, to your point about him being sort of uh, um, uh, antecedent of sorts to to Garvey and and the 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 broader Pan African you know uh, approach or or, or argument. Uh, anyway, he he was doing it all. I mean, he was you know. Um, for me, number three is similar. You you already mentioned it. Uh, 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 his work with the Negro world, uh, his you know, to me, he is one of those you know emancipatory journalists that said we need media making and journalism that is factual, honest, accurate, and principled, but uh, as that is an, an overt component to Pan African struggle and, and liberation. So. Uh, and I, I just I want to highlight that. And, and uh, um, it, anyway, so that's why it's my number three, just something to point out. Uh, it's, it's because especially I, I just want to say again, in, at this time of, of uh, virtuality and digit, you know, the digital world, I mean, we, we can't lose sight of that, that principle, that ethic of, of, of journalism, the, the emancipatory approach uh, to the work that we're doing. So anyway, mm -hmm. again, Shout out to, to Triple H. Okay, so my number two is just the fact that he was a prolific and very present um, street corner orator. And I just admire that so much because that couldn't have been me. Like, I do a lot of speaking and shit, but like, I, it's things that I'm invited to do. It's in closed kind of organized programming. You will never catch me, okay? Going to stand on the corner and being like, all right, y'all. So in how Europe underdeveloped Africa, like, you know, just, just spinning, like, I just, that's probably my introversion. I know people don't th probably think I'm an introvert, but that's probably my introversion. I couldn't imagine just going and standing on a street corner and just dropping this knowledge, like bar after bar. He would do this for hours and draw crowds of thousands. I just think that that's so amazing. And that, and that just speaks to his wide range because he was writing articles, editing, writing book reviews. So reading so many book reviews, which is such an interesting genre, but he reviewed everything. That's a, a ten, that's a, I guess a two B, but like, and then just out there spitting knowledge just off the top of the dome period. And so like, I just, that's very amazing to me and very inspiring. It I'm sure will be difficult for some to believe, but uh, I'm gonna call it number two. This was actually my number one, but I'm gonna go ahead and switch it up just so we can, we can be in line here because your point about the street orator is extremely important. When I, when I was doing my, my thesis, on John Henry Clark, this is where I learned about the the tradition, or more, I should say, about the tradition of of, of oratory that that um, people like Malcolm X certainly are connected to, uh, and that it was through Clark that I learned that that Malcolm got a lot of that, as many others did, from Hubert Harrison. Uh, Garvey certainly was one that learned a lot for, of that, and the ability. You know, and sometimes we make fun of the folks we see doing versions of that today. But the ability to just get up out of nowhere and get up literally on a crate or a box with no microphone and just start rocking and draw a crowd uh, it requires skill and requires an, an ability to to speak to what people want to hear. Um, and you got to have some heart because obviously, you you know, it's an un you know, it's an unfiltered space and people will respond. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, so I'm going to move that from number one to number two, so that we can be in line here. But I'm, 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 you know, and then you know, because I was also had to note that, like, you know, talking about the, the the freestyling of the MC that many of us grew up, you know, as, as a, at least appreciating, if not able to do, you know, that you know, if so, if you like, if you love hip hop and the freestyle tradition and all of that, then then another reason you should love Hubert Henry Harrison or appreciate him because that was, I mean, you got to have. You gotta have verbal lyrical skill and ability okay. to freestyle. So yeah. And in a cipher, by the way. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, because certainly I'm sure people was like, shut the fuck up. Or like, what you mean by that? Like, you know, doing all sorts of stuff. So um okay, y'all. My number one is located in the Hubert Henry Harrison reader. It's actually called a Hubert Harrison reader, edited with introduction and notes by Jeffrey Perry. It is my favorite. 
favorite thing of all time called The Descent of Dr. Du Bois. It was published in The Voice on January 25th, 1918. And this was in response to Du Bois's closed ranks. Now, y'all know mm. I, I rock with mm. Du Bois, but this was ether. Like, Du Bois was essentially like, hey, bro, what are you talking about? Like, our leaders have fallen. Um, he tripping. We do not need to join to close uh, ranks and join uh, World War One and fight in this imperialist war. Um, and so he uh, he really just went in, right? So on, he writes. Uh, this is actually in a, a, a follow up. Um, no, 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 I'm gonna read this part from here. So he he closes with this line. For the sake of the larger usefulness of Dr. Du Bois, we hope he will be able to show that he can remain as editor of the crisis, but we fear that it will require a good deal of explaining for our leaders, like Caesar's wife, must be above suspicion. So basically he was saying he out here, but he got to he 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 got to run, you know, run us this explanation for why it is that he is advocating for uh, joining this imperialist war and leading our people amok. So I just I just really love that piece. I think it's great. And it's interesting uh, as a uh, related uh, tidbit, like Du Bois was suspicious of Harrison throughout. So, you know, I go, I've gone through most of his correspondence and like he wrote a letter to, I think it was, it was the university in the Danish West Indies in St. Croix where uh, he, Harrison had ostensibly gotten a PhD and Du Bois wrote like, did he really get a PhD from here? Like he was trying to check for the records, you know, and I don't think that there was never a response, but uh, yeah, petty. So he was big mad, right? It wasn't necessarily in response to this, but he was just, he was seeing how much Hubert Harrison was circulating and how critical Hubert Harrison was of particular types of leadership. And so he, you know, he was like, does he really have a degree? So anyway. You know, that's a, that's a good book project, the Pan-African pettiness. Right. African, you know, the history of because because we got some we got some some luminaries who who <laughs> get, Listen, that, get, that's Jay. <laughs> um, that's Jay. you know, again, similar to your point in reference to, to Jeffrey Perry, one of the things that, that, that my number one for, for Hubert Henry Harrison, uh switching it out for the oratory one is is what what Perry talks about in his uh multi volumes or or why he's written those multiple volumes on Harrison which is Harrison's unbiting that's right unbiting dedication to uh labor and the working class and you know uh, and and probably one of the the uh, and I'll ask you this, but one of the the, the earliest, uh, uh, you know, advocates or proponents of what would now be called a racial racialist capitalist approach to, a, you know, a analysis. Um, but but always remember that 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 core of working class struggle, which which is still something that we all, uh, you know, continue to deal with uh, in our in our politics and our in our uh, in our work. But uh, so anyway, that for me is always, you know, well, is an easy replacement to, to number one, his, his mm -hmm. racial capitalism and, and, and working class focus. You know. People might want to shade me as a theorist of racial capitalism. But when I define racial capitalism as like a war driven, racially hierarchical political economy rooted in things like super exploitation, expropriation, um, dispossession, absorption of risk. It is from reading people like Harrison because he's always talking about the linkages between imperialism, war, racism, and capitalist accumulation. And so, you know, when I think about people like Harrison or Du Bois or any of my Black communists as early theorists of racial capitalism, it's literally from reading, they don't use that term, but it's from reading what they wrote and being like, this is a way to really describe, define, and analyze what we now call racial capitalism and in a concrete way, because they already talk this is what they're talking about. And so, um, you know, these definitions, like we don't, well, I didn't just make it up. This is literally what these people are talking about. And I'm just naming it racial capitalism just to give that framework some oomph <laughs> because it mm -hmm. can be relatively ill-defined. So, you know, people can acknowledge me or not, but that's the point. So, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that is our top five dead or alive happy birthday to hubert henry harrison and um hopefully you all learned something you didn't know about this giant of radical blackness and um this was fun thank you for sharing your top five jared mm -hmm.
Right on. Thank you. All right, y'all. For this segment of Left Disquisition, we are joined by my girls, Layla Brown and Erica Keynes, as well as Jab. And what we're going to talk about is our dope weekend in Philly, our weekend of action around uh, Mumia and Walter Wallace. So welcome, y'all. Okay. Welcome. Okay, so the first question that I want everybody to answer is like, why did y'all pull up? You know, we all came from elsewhere, so why was it important to uh, to pull up for Mumia and for Walter Wallace? Yeah, I can um, I can start um, for myself. Uh, I can attribute Yane Indigo for that. Um, I did when Mumia got COVID and the um, congestional heart. Um, situation, I did a teaching um, and Yane was a part of that. And when she, when that ended, she just hit me up. It was like, I want you to be a part of this weekend. Um, so that's how I ended up. <laughs> I think for me, uh, kind of similar, um, Mumia's case has been in the background of my life for a long time. But a couple years ago, when I was a postdoc at Bucknell, I was asked to facilitate a conversation um, about let the fire burn uh, with uh, community members and members of the faculty there. And I was just really shocked by, you know, just two and a half hours outside of the city, people having not, never heard of what happened. Um, and so then this weekend when Dr. CBS asked me to roll with her, I was like, let's go. Because, you know, on top of COVID, I hadn't been out in a while and I wasn't here for the George Floyd protests because I was out of the country. So I was like, what, what, what better way to jump back in? So for me, are you at, so for no me, it, why were you I there? Mean, my bad. I mean, you know, for me, it was, uh, it's, it, it's, it's been a long standing policy. We support mm -hmm. political prisoners, number one. And, uh, uh, Mumia is, is someone, uh, I and others have been supporting for a long time. So, uh, that and the timing, honestly, the family scheduling worked out. Uh, the desire to get out of the house worked out. Uh, the desire to spend a couple extra hours with my oldest, which is sometimes, you know, challenging when you get a little, you know, people grow. It's a little hard to, to, to hold on a little bit more, even, in, even in, a, in a quarantine. So I thought this was a perfect uh, way to do it. And then, of course, not the least of which was I knew a lot of people that I knew were going to be there. So it's always, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. first and foremost, always you got to support Mumi and all political prisoners. So absolutely. Period. Well, besides the opportunity to meet my favorite revolutionary, Zion, um, you know, <laughs> for, all, for all the reasons that everybody mentioned, that's why I was there. It was important to show up funky, fresh and in the flesh to uh, support Mumia. Hopefully this will be the last protest of this kind where he is behind bars. And so um, things are critical and crucial now. So it was important to be there on the ground um, at the source. Right. Return to the source, as Cabral says. So, um what were some of y'all favorite moments? There was a lot. There was a lot happening. And again, this was a two day thing. First day was the, the rally for Mumia. The second day was the rally uh, for for Walter Wallace Jr. Um, at Malcolm X Park. So what were some of y'all favorite moments? Um, for sure was um, Yane singing because that was the first time I've ever yes. heard you sing. So uh, she's super dope, super talented, mm -hmm. um, incredible organizer. Um, Johanna hearing her speak. Um, she was like, shut Princeton the fuck down. He went off. <laughs> yeah, that hyped me up. Um, and then I really, really enjoyed um, the march. Uh, Zion got to DJ for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Free Mumia! <laughs> Free Mumia! <laughs> <laughs> so I knew he got to play the drums. So just seeing him be active in that way, um, that, was, that was fun. And then the Walter Wallace um, Sunday was was incredible. I think that that was like emotionally um, something that, that I was glad to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would echo all of those. Um, it was also nice to meet several people in person that I have not met, but we have been uh, inter interacting online. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I have to say my favorite part, I know we're gonna talk more about this later, was actually handing out books at the, Walk at the Walter Wallace rally um, with mm -hmm. his organization, uh, Liberation Through Reading. I always like being around the kids, which leads to my second favorite moment when Zion was like, um, I didn't know we were marching this far and I'm ready to turn back. 
So let's go. <laughs> He's like, lead the way. <laughs> it just it reminded me of you know all of the the kids who get who get you know taken to protest and are like, okay, when is this over? Uh, so I felt him. <laughs> That's how he ended up DJing. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jared? Uh. There were a number of, of of close seconds, but I would have to say that when when my daughter got to meet Pam Africa, that was a, a, a very pleasurable moment for me. Uh, mm -hmm. She's been at a number of rallies where Pam has spoken, but either she was too young or the you know the moment didn't happen where they could meet. Uh, so that was you know that was that was one, and you know because I will and I'm always referencing Pam when I you know need an excuse for some of my own language, so. It was it was uh, it was good for her to to meet the source, uh, uh, but uh, but also you know I will say getting you know uh, it, it wasn't a, a lot of time and we didn't do the march, uh, but uh, um, having my daughter in and uh, as well as me get to meet you all in person for the first time I think. Well, Layla, we've met before, but I'll be ready to say not me, buddy. I know, I know, it's been a while, and my memory is bad. Remember, I so not remember. And I and I and I didn't and I didn't know you as the the the, the full adult, you know, doctor. You it's know, okay. I was probably a teenager. I'm sure. I mean, you know, so I mean, you know, uh, so all of that, all of that was good. But I will say, it was great for her to for my my baby girl to meet Pam. That was great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, I just love seeing both Erica and um, our comrade did on with the kids and just the, the revolutionary patience, which y'all know I do not have, but I'm working on the just the, the care and patience with the children doing multiple things at once, making sure that they were cool, that they were relatively entertained as, and just still participating fully in um you know, in the march and in the rally. Like, I will always believe you have never seen a revolutionary in action until you have seen Erica with Zion on her hip, who is half Listen. of her size, not only doing the chance, but grooving to the chance. Yes. Okay. She's like, Period. No. <laughs> you <laughs> like, that's <laughs> it. Okay. And so that was amazing. Also, you know, as everybody said, meeting everybody, handing out the books, um, hearing Walter Wallace's uh, wife and family speak. Uh, was amazing hearing Yane sing and rap um, yeah. was dope and it was just it was a beautiful mix of like our revolutionary culture as well as politics and so um, so those were some of my favorite moments for sure so anyway y'all why is it so important especially now especially in this moment but you know always but especially in this moment to free political prisoners like why is this such a crucial aspect of our abolition or our black liberation work they are veterans, right? Yeah. Like, um, if we're in a war, that's the first thing you ask for, right? Um, but aside from that, I, I just find it remarkable in in my time in, in abolition and, and, and learning about all these political prisoners and being involved, that it's not a widespread thing. And it's certainly not as widespread within our community as it should be. Like when I host these abolition things, there's more white people um, mm -hmm. typically that show up. Um, so that's that troubles me because you know these are the same groups of people that that talk about Asada Shakur, um, but don't ever mention Sunyata Akali. Um, so, but it, but I think that it is important um, not just because that there are veterans, but because there's political prisoners be in the making currently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talked about Aunt Smith, Daydon currently. Mm -hmm. Got the charges. Got the charges. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, members of PSL just had a whole thing with their what's going on in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Josh Williams. There's the people from um, Baltimore Uprising are still in prison. So this is an ongoing situation that that we need to focus on, not just on the Mumias and and Kai, but those who are to come, especially in this moment, in this political moment, we know there's gonna be much more uprisings. We know that they are like, you know, um, making laws against the ability to protest and how that's going to uh, impact us. So I think that it's important to always fixate that. Mm -hmm. It's important to know also that Asada Shakur is a political prisoner. Exile, yes. deportation, she is still on the FBI most wanted list. That is a form of, of carcerality. That's all part of this, right? Like. 
Um, I'm sure Cuba is amazing, but I'm sure she probably would love to be able to be here freely and be, you know, back. I know that uh, in the brief conversation I was able to have with uh, Nahanda Abiodun, and I think that was the summer of 2019, you can tell she was very sad. Like she had not been able to see or hug her family in quite some time. And so those of our, you know, those political prisoners who are in exile are also part of this, right? We need to think about um, that as a form of political imprisonment. So um, yeah, what about you, Layla? I mean, I would echo everything, but I, you know, I think to just kind of extend Erica's, um, I guess, metaphor that there are veterans, because, you know, the reason why political prisoners exist is because what they were doing was already trying to push back against the ways in which we live and operate. And they were always doing that for more people than themselves, right? They are in prison for the work they were doing for us as communities. Um, you know, whether we always understand and realize the depth and and reach of the, that kind of work you know is yet to be seen um but if we are thinking about the ways in which we're you know railroaded and targeted as black people for just everyday ways of being we also have to think about the other end of that spectrum that as we are fighting those things that we are in prison for both we are in prison for pushing back against those and we are in prison for just being right so this process of thinking through abolition is thinking through all the different ways in which we are forced to engage in the carceral state. And it has to be undone. Like it just, that shit got to get torn down. Period. I mean, everything everybody has said, I mean, me too. I mean, it's, it's, they are our prisoners <laughs> of war. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. I didn't that's not what I you know, I'm not trying to anyway. But mm -hmm. but absolutely. Like like and it, and it is something you know Erica pointed to it but it's something that I thought uh you know uh, uh I think about a lot that Bob Boyle said to us Mumia's lawyer and the lawyer for several other political prisoners that he said, you know, there's going to be more. Uh you already talked about Day Dan. We were there. I mean at the rally Philly. I I already mentioned I got the shirt for free Aunt uh Aunt Smith. Uh, you know, so I mean, they're being created uh, in 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 small ways and 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 likely larger ways going forward. So, and, and certainly, I would think that many of us, at least, would want to encourage uh, levels of organization and even escalation to the point of what some have already been doing or did that got them locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we want to be able to be prepared for people to get you know similarly you know uh, addressed by the state. Uh, and then very selfishly, I would also say as someone who is, is for very non-political reasons, spent even just small bits of time in holding cells to be even the thought for five minutes that there wouldn't be large throngs of crowds out there trying to get me out would be painful. So, I mean, it's just on that level that I, I, I would hate to think that that especially if doing something for the people. Should I, you know, suffer that fate that, that there wouldn't be people out there trying to get me out? I mean, you know, so like, well, of course, we got to, you know. Yeah. make noise for them. Hell yeah. It reminds me of the conversation we were having earlier during Shoot the Shit about perfect victims. And it's as mm. if we just let these people, you know, because they were protesting, you know, they were protesting, they were doing thing, doing all sorts of shit, right? To get us free, um, engaging in all sorts of radicalism. It's as if we've accepted that this is the logical outcome, right? To be thrown under the jail. And fuck that. Like we, these, uh, they're, these are not only our veterans, these are, these are, our um our teachers and our guides and these are people whose legacy we need to continue and uh they deserve to be free right all all prisoners need to be free um and political prisoners are a, a special category of that because what they're doing is not criminal theoretically we're supposed to have free speech freedom of assembly freedom of press all these things um and but it's criminalized because it's against right it's seen as subversion and you know against the state and all that so um it Freeing political prisoners needs to be an, is, is an essential part of our work and needs to be even more essential. I'm um, very much from the school that says, regardless of what their individual claims or cases say, we should assume they all absolutely did everything they're accused of and should operate mm -hmm. on that basis and say, yeah, they did it and they should be free anyway. And we should get them out. Right. However, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did, um, I would be like remiss to not mention that I did get a chance to speak to both uh, Janine and Janet Africa. Um, mm -hmm. So that to me was like, I didn't get a picture though. They don't got his picture. Um, <laughs> it was like, it's awkward for me to be like, can I take a picture? Um, but I did get a conversation. It was a, it was a good 15, 20 minutes that I got to speak with them about what it was like for them inside and just being able also, when they all stood on that stage with like 150 years collectively, like just 
being able to speak to these people and mm -hmm. hearing that um, and then them advising me as an organizer of, you know, you got to stay strong because this is a mental thing and they're going to try to break you down. Um, you know, so that, that was impactful. And that's just another reason to just, you know, continue to push mm -hmm. and continue to fight because we can free them. I think seeing mm -hmm. them on the stage show that we can bring them home. You know, they do yeah. come home if we fight for them. Mm -hmm. And when they come home, they need something mm -hmm. to come back to. We have to support um, our elders and support political prisoners once they're out of prison. Like the struggle, the the advocacy, the struggle, the dedication doesn't stop once they're released. They need to have a life to come back to, and it's our responsibility. Like they gave their lives for the struggle for our freedom, so we also um, owe a debt. Um, okay, so finally, I just want to talk about liberation through reading, which is such an amazing program that you started, Erica. You've given away, I think, it's at twenty five hundred books since two thousand and eleven. You know, I think we've all. 2017. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, that's way more. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've all tried to contribute in different ways. It was amazing to just see, you know, kids being delighted coming to get the books, their parents being delighted about, you know, and they're like, how much are these? And we're like, they're free, you know? And so yeah. it's just such an amazing program. So can you talk a little bit about why you started it and why it was important to, to bring the books to the, to the rally on behalf of Walter Wallace? Yeah, when I um, when I started Liberation Through Reading, I wasn't um, tied to any organization or anything. I was, um, you know, just uh, shooting shit on Twitter, <laughs> basically, but still looking for a way to like tap in. And there was like a local community um, uh, back to school event, and I was asked, you know, if I can participate in that. And I didn't know, you know, what way I can contribute, so I just went on Twitter and. Well, first I went on Amazon and created a wish list of books mm -hmm. um, that I had purchased for my son um, because since he was born, it's been an intentional search for uh, black children's books. But not just like any black children's books, but, you know, because um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. But, <laughs> but you know, ones that have, you know, some sort of meeting, ones that I grew up with. Um, you know, uh, and ones that were beyond sports, you hear? And, <laughs> and um yeah, so when when I was invited and then I, I put that call out on Twitter, you know, if anybody would like to just purchase books. And then the next day or the next two days, like 10 boxes of children's books showed up. And it's been, I've been doing that continuously since. Uh, what I do is invite local, um, organ like when I go to different cities that are not mine in my local area, because I live in Maryland and Anne Arundel County. Um, so that's where the initial uh, ones have been set up locally here, but I've been to Baltimore, I've been to Brooklyn in New York, I've been to Philadelphia twice. Um, so when I go, I always invite local organizations. And one of the dope things are um, in 2018, I was in Philadelphia, I was invited by um, Natalie Seren, she's a Haitian, um, dope Haitian singer uh, in Philadelphia, but she had invited me to come and we did it in the arts district and I had, gave a call out to Jared Ware if he knew any um, any organizations that would like to come and uh, Free Mumia came. And a full circle moment was that I got to organize a part of this this weekend with Joe who was at that event, um, mm -hmm. at my event, Liberation Through Reading. Uh, so it just felt like a full circle moment. Um, and I was, I was very honored to have done that for Walter Wallace's family, Walter Wallace Jr.'s family. Um, his wife was incredibly thankful. Um, and that made me, you know, uh, their kids were playing with Zion on the playground. Um, I got to discuss not only just the book drive, but I got to discuss Black Lives for Peace and, you know, things that Eugene was doing. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the intention. Um, I bring the books to children, but it's also, I'm bringing these local organizations and organizers <laughs> because I want to get people involved in what's happening in their community. So the books are sort of like, you know, bait. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that we can discuss what's happening because for me it's um initially when i started it, it black panther was a big deal and i always say this you know that we we leave these these forms of representation on our screens right but is there blackness in your home like do you talk about blackness in what ways do you talk about blackness in your in your home um because we're always looking for it elsewhere like we're looking for it on the screen and we're looking and we don't have cultivated libraries for our children to just discover you know different 
a rays of blackness. Like we're not all the same. So I like that I do offer um, historical sort of like, you know, books on Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, but then I offer books written by Angela Davis, but she has a children's book. Bell Hooks has plenty. Alice Walker has plenty. Alice Walker has won a war. So that's why I, um, that's how I hook in the BAP stuff. Like, oh yeah, you know, war isn't good. And this is why it's not. You know? <laughs> and it's a beautifully illustrated book. Um, and so I get to talk about all these things. And and I myself is a I'm, I'm an avid reader, and I believe that fiction um, is is just as useful as nonfiction, especially when it's written by Black women. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm 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 very thankful because it is a pay it forward sort of community thing. I don't do it by myself. Um, you know, I don't have a car, so people help me get these books to communities. Mm -hmm. uh, John traveled from North Carolina and helped me get it to Philly. Um, so that's a community initiative. Uh, my comrade Eli does it often, comes, will travel from wherever they're at to assist me. Um, you know, people pay for the books, you know, on the wish list. Um, mm -hmm. They're very happy to contribute that way. And thus far, 2,500 have been given and we turn five on, um, in August. And so, yeah, so I never like to say it's like, it's just me alone, um, but but I am happy that I was able to do this. And I do encourage people because it's not that hard um, to try to do it themselves because there are mm -hmm. other programs, but those people have money and nonprofits attached <laughs> and I have a uh, community. Yeah. So you grabbed some books for, for Zora, didn't you, uh, Layla? I did. I Andy. did. I actually even read one to her last night. I mean, yeah. Was it last night? No, night before last, um, before I came home. And she was she was excited. They were excited about the books that I brought back to them. And I'm excited about that, Erica. You know, I remember how much work my mom did when we were kids to make sure we had books. And like even other mm -hmm. things, like buying us birthday cards and coloring them brown because she's like, I'm not getting <laughs> these cards with these white kids on it. Or having fights with other people's parents for giving us white baby dolls. She was like, she can play with that somewhere else. But in this house, we play with things that represent us, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, I just appreciate the work that you're doing and will continue to support in whatever way that I can. Mm -hmm, period. And Jerry, you have two girls. They're older now, but like, how do you encourage or how did you cultivate reading for them? It, it was a routine, uh, literally daily experience uh, mm -hmm. and continues to be. So we've read books together. Uh, I created, I, I mean, I created board games, created reading materials, wow. did the same thing that Layla did um, in terms of uh, we had, a, you know, somebody gave a, 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 tried to give a life size, uh, blonde, white, blue eyed Barbie. doll. It didn't even make it out of the trunk of the car. The joint was in the trash, and I wrote an email to everybody and was like, <laughs> Not don't email. ever. Yeah, I did. I was like, we got to be clear. Like, I, if it wasn't clear already, I think now we need to be clear. Don't do it. Don't invite people to do it because my children will never get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might not get it back to return it because I threw it straight in the trash. So it didn't, you know, no receipts, nothing. So uh, all of that. I mean, and uh, 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 and then we, 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 you know, every time, Dr. CBS, when you gave birthday gift, you know, uh, to the girls, we get straight to the 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 the, the blackest of bookstores and <laughs> and order up, and uh, uh, and in fact, my youngest is reading Doctor Fernandez's uh, work on the, the Young Lords now. So I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, we just stay it's just, it's just routine, and we you know it, you know try to put up as much symbolism in the house. So you know nobody needs to go outside to see representations of themselves or elements of their heritage and. Um, that's it. Right. Yeah, I want to shout out, uh, shout out the comrade No Name. Um, not only mm -hmm. does, does she start her book club, but she actually has a physical site. So Layla and I will be venturing to Los Angeles for my birthday weekend. So stay tuned mm -hmm. for another Black Radical brunch with the comrade, uh, and we will be visiting that space. So I'm very much looking forward. We'll be, you know, of course, bringing tons of books for that space. So I'm just encouraged by our Black Radical women comrades who are building out, who are like, hey, read. But also, we gonna help you, mm -hmm. you do, right? I do want to say, like, a shout out to you, Sharice, because not only did Sharice donate and already contribute books, but then showed up <laughs> at the spot with more <laughs> books, and she showed up with Mumia that went like, as soon as I hit the table, it was gone. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I'm deeply, deeply, deeply appreciative of your support. Of course, uh, we out here. You know, our job as the petty bourgeoisie is to redistribute out all that shit, right? This is why, you know, this is how we can commit class suicide, one of the many ways. So uh, this was no petty dope, bourgeoisie. Oh. The petty bourgeoisie. This is amazing, y'all. <laughs> yeah, so this was this was such a, um, a dope conversation. I'm glad we all were able to convene in Philly and to meet and to support. And I can't wait to our next um you know, our next adventure, uh, mm -hmm. next black radical adventure to to support our political prisoners, uh, to to keep pushing for black liberation, um, et cetera. Period. Um, you know, we need to do a brunch with Erica and just get on down to the DC area because you know that's where a brunch is popping. Yes, yes. Unlimited yes. 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 <laughs> anywhere else. And I yes. can't. that's why I yep. don't do <laughs> oh, get keto oh. to show up that way too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. So, oh, wait. <laughs> My shirt. Hey, oh, Free yeah. Maria. Yes, yes, yes. Jared, you had yours on yesterday on the morning show. I did. Yeah. I did. And the free ant shirt after that. So I was, yeah. I've been. You've been out here. <laughs> okay. All right. Take Thanks, y'all. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, y'all. So this week for uh, what I'm on, I'm really just thinking about refining the thesis of my book because right now it's very, very big, right? It's about capitalist racism, racial capitalism, whatever you want to call it. And it's linked to, um, you know, Wall Street imperialism, anti-Blackness and anti-radicalism, anti-communism, and then interracial class conflict or, you know, what I'm calling a uh, class schadenfreude. So, but what, I, you know, as I'm writing, I'm thinking, you know, I can narrow it down. I don't have to make this big grand statement. I can just be thinking about how the convergence of um, the rise of the U.S. to capitalist hegemony uh, as a white supremacist, racist <laughs> settler colony um, brings together all of these dynamics. And so, in other words, like thinking, you know, making the thesis more narrow. So like, I'm not making some grand statement about necessarily racial capitalism or capitalist racism, but rather um, there are these particular uh, manifestations and that to under, essentially, I guess, to understand the rise of capitalism in the United States, we need to understand all of these different dynamics that are happening and how um, anti-blackness and anti-radicalism are central uh, to that rise. And then everything else is sort of built around, um, around that discussion. And so essentially my story, you know, as I'm thinking about it, it's, it really is more about the, the convergence or the, the mutual, the mutual, co the co-constitutionality, but also the imbrication of anti-blackness and anti-radicalism and racial capitalism or capitalist racism is important to the end that it reveals why it is that these two technologies of domination and repression are endemic in the United States. And so it's really a matter of uh, framing, right? That the book isn't really about racial capitalism. The book is about anti-radicalism and anti-blackness and racial capitalism is a way to, um, to make it legible why those things matter um, and also why they continue to be reproduced in tandem um, over time. Because, you know, even thinking about something like interracial class dynamics, which seem seemingly has nothing to do with anti-radicalism, um, is really important because there is a way in which, you know, the niggerati, the black bourgeoisie tended to be, um, you know, anti-radical as the sort of the petty bourgeois, you know, black quote unquote capitalist class, they tended to be, you know, anti-union. They tended to be, um, to align with, with big capital in particular ways. They tended to be proponents of segregation because that's the way that they were able to accumulate in terms of their businesses. Um, funeral home owners, for example, tended to be some of the most exploitative, um, they tended to be some of the richest in the black community, but also some of the most exploitative because there's no, there's not very much competition. But at the same time, there's also a section of the, the niggerati that is radical and that's targeted by the state because it's understood that 
um, because they had newspapers in particular and because they were circulating writing that they would then uh, arouse the masses, right? And endemic in the state's critique of and surveillance of these editors. So, you know, anywhere from um, W.E.B. Du Bois to uh, a J.A. Rogers to, um, you know, there's, you know, even Marcus Garvey, who was not a communist, but, but part of what they were uh, surveilling is, or part of part of their anxiety was also about education, right? Like we should never taught these niggas how to read, um, because even with the black upper class, there's still this understanding that black people are susceptible to foreign influence, and if the the black managerial class, the black you know the black ruling elite is susceptible to these radical ideas, then they will then go and try to inculcate the masses. So there's a lot there's a lot of different class dynamics that are happening within the black community itself that directly relate to um, to the anti-black and anti-radical specifications of US society. And so, um, you know, as I'm finishing up reading through um, some of the documents that I'm engaging, my thesis, I'm sort of reworking and rethinking what it is, what is the sort of the centrifugal force of the text and what it is that I actually want um, what are the takeaways, right? Like after you read my book, like do I want you to leave with a more refined definition of racial capitalism? Not really. There's a lot out there, but it's more so we really cannot understand anti-blackness without understanding anti-radicalism. And that is because we live in a capitalist racist or a racial capitalist society. And so um, it's just a matter of like how to articulate that and to keep you know, what What I want my key take you, takeaway to be central to uh, my analysis. So that's what I'm on this week, just writing and refining. All right, Jared, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? I do. Uh, and again, uh, until I'm <laughs> proven wrong or have a cause to be, you know, uh, differently situated, this was another great show. Congratulations. Uh, for a lucky 13th, you know what I mean? Uh, you know. Friday the 13th. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. It's not, that's not the date, but it's Friday. It'll drop on Friday and it's 13th episode. And it's the 13th show. So, you know, I mean, it's- it, 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 It's so know. facto. <laughs> exactly. Uh, look, I, I, I love the conversations uh, uh, with all your guests today, uh, uh, as usual. So much more to get into. And the subtle differences- in all of the little strands of, of radical blackness uh, that are exhibited on this program are just great. So that was really it. I mean, the the I would say that if anybody finished the episode this week and didn't catch all the subtle shade that was thrown throughout, it's just a call <laughs> for more study. The more you learn, the more you catch, the more you get to enjoy inside subtle jokes and, you know, it's another little, what do they call them? Easter eggs for people to find in in, mm -hmm. in, in, in in programs like this. So anyway, great job. Shout out to you and your guests again for another great episode. Thank you so much. And so, you know, that's our show for this Friday evening. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. CBS. That's Doc Jab. And we are signing off. <laughs>